Let's Sanford do it. Biggers, welcome to Bad at Sports. <laughs> Sanford, you've got a slideshow. Are you? Did you want to roll through these, or are they just going to roll just, through while we talk? I just have these. Uh, we'll go through them. I'll just hit them randomly. If we want to talk about them, we will. Just figure to have some visuals in the back. I think I, that okay. does sound lovely. Uh, usually we do an audio-only type, type jam, and it, 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 I'm just like, whoa, there's things. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. I hear too. you know, throw a Sa- wrench in the system. Sanford, uh, I, I feel like the, the place I need to start with you is... Uh, is that for years and years I've had a a problem getting my arms around exactly how to understand your practice. It seems to sort of take all of these different forms through performance and music and video and sculpture and painting and 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 Mm -hmm. and and I feel like every time I encounter it it feels somehow totally different Hmm. and uh, yeah yeah, it's, uh, you know. WTF? Was that yeah. a question? What? WTF, yeah. Sanford? What's going on? I don't, know. I, I, I don't know. I think I have some type of creative schizophrenia. I just work all around various disciplines. But realistically, I think conceptually, thematically, all the work is very, very tightly tied together. Um, let's just say, for example, this is where the visuals come in. Click. All right, so this piece right here, Blossom, uh, which is a piano with a fabricated tree growing from it. This piano plays, so this actually incorporates my um, music. So it's playing a my own version of Strange Fruit. And conceptually, this is really goes back to lynching and the dark past of America's South. And, you know, let's flip to another piece. Let's go to, let's say, a quilt, a painting. This also deals with the exact same topic. Um, quilts were used along the Underground Railroad as signposts, at least reportedly so. And as signposts, slaves would be escaping and they would see a quilt of a certain pattern or a certain folded a certain way over a banister and it was to give directions on where to go. Um, so I've been taking quilts and painting directly on there so there's already this encoded language existing in the quilt and then I put on another la- layer of language. To me, that still goes back to the same past, the story of cotton, the story of slavery, escape, freedom. But I also lived in Japan for several years, and this idea of freedom goes beyond just freedom from, let's say, social freedom, but also spiritual freedom. So there's this notion of transcendence, both on the earthly plane and the heavenly plane. So now, in terms of multidisciplinary, I know that you're working on a uh, music project Mm -hmm. that accompanies some of your visual work uh, that you've been working on in Louisville. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I have a group called Moon Medicine. Some of you may have already seen us perform. We recently performed in Kentucky at the uh, KMAC. Um, But we also performed at Art Basel uh, a few years ago um, as one of the headlining acts for their um, off-site project right uh, in front of the Bass Museum. And what it is is a music ensemble. I play obviously piano, keyboards, synthesizer, and I'm the musical director. I have a DJ, a bassist, and a guitarist. Um, and a VJ who's on stage mixing video content from some of my video projects. And we consider the video to actually be like the fifth member or the sixth member of the band. Um, So while I was, all this going back to Louisville, a few weeks ago I took the band down there to do a self-imposed two-week residency to develop new music um, and new sound pieces that will be rolling out over the next year in various other projects. I have a show coming at this show coming up at the Studio Museum in Harlem, and I'm doing a painting that will have a QR code on it. You go into the QR code, it will take you online to a video and music project that's derived from this residency in Kentucky. Um, The band will also be performing at Lincoln Center in the spring in New York, and we'll be using some of the video. Um, I'm also going to uh, Africa in January to shoot a new film. That will be part of the visual content, and then the music from the Kentucky residency will be the musical component. So what's the focus of the, what's the film that you're shooting in Africa? It's the third part of a trilogy. The first film was shot in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, my main character is um, a Brazilian expat named Ricardo Camilo. Um, and he is the central figure of that first film that was shot in Stuttgart. And essentially it follows him dressed up as a clown as he goes through life putting on a mask and taking the mask off. And of course this is a metaphor for everybody who has to code switch just to navigate society. The second film was shot in Salvador de Bahia in Brazil, Um, same main character. And the third one, which we will shoot in January, will be shot in Senegal and Ethiopia. And 
in the second video, basically, he transcends this notion of identity and becomes a sort of non-gender specific alien figure. And the third one that we'll shoot in Africa, he's going to transcend his body altogether and become sort of a spirit entity. Once again, dealing with transcendence, being that it was shot in Europe, um, Brazil, and Africa, it's also abstractly retracing the triangle trade route of the North Atlantic slave trade. So once again, all thematically based to even this work. So are these all, I mean, do you look at these things as different bodies of work? Or, I mean, you obviously are borrowing from images from the films in terms of things to accompany the music and vice versa. So, I mean, ultimately, is it, is it one big piece? Is it a series? Is it individual things that happen to have uh, thematic elements in common? How do you, in, in your mind, sort of delineate the different activities? I see it as one big project. The thing about it is, you know, we have this... We're sort of hindered by looking at things at the moment. We're at this art fair right now. We'll be at another art fair in a few weeks. What did you do this week? What did you do last week? And these things are seen in a vacuum. But realistically, I look at my whole body of work as something that expands over my lifetime. So the idea is once you see it all together, whether it be video, sound, sculpture, painting, it's all really one large project. Does that make any sense to anyone? All right. How you guys doing? I feel like we have we're like... You know, okay. It's, we set it up deathmatch style. Yeah. <laughs> so that uh, you've, it feels like you're interviewing for a job. We're having a beat it style knife fight at the end, actually. <laughs> you, you missed sound check for that, but everything's all set. So I, I want to get back to the question of transcendence and where that comes from and, and how you sort of trace the various lineages of how transcendence operates within your work. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, uh, I mean, it, the, the themes of Transcendence and freedom seem to kind of interweave, so maybe we need to start with uh, the history of slavery and, and mm -hmm. how that figures into your work. That's a weird piece you made. Yeah, this is a, yeah, it's a sound investment. <laughs> um, yeah, so if we can transcend back to the images again, that would be great. Um, particularly, it was actually good that we were on that cotton piece, because I think that... Um, let's see. Yes. This would have been 2011. Everything in here is basically 2011 to right now. This was a few weeks ago. So very, very recent work. So back to transcendence. Um, I think there is a way to transcend through materials, through metaphor, through concepts, and so on. Um, let's go back to slavery. Cotton, backbone of American economy, made on the backbone of black people. I use these clouds. These are raw cotton clouds, raw cotton stretched over wire mesh. and. For me, these are very transcendent pieces because they're very light, fluffy, airy, almost silly. But when you think about what it really takes to make that cotton and the deep, dark history, there's that sort of underbelly, which I think is sort of a metaphor for life in general, the good, the bad, and the ugly, transcendence over tribulation, and so on. So I mean, that right there is actually a very concrete example of that idea of transcendence. Um, but on a more personal level, I think you know, for any of us to achieve. You always have to transcend. It's always about transcendence. That's what life is. You know, it's not about obtaining one thing. It's about going through that and obtaining many things and letting them know at the end, it all means nothing. It all goes to shit. So hopefully you got your mind right. <laughs> Free your mind and your ass will follow. There you go. Parliament, you can't argue with that. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. I I, you, I lost it. It's funny because it, uh, then I just backed off and I was like, oh, okay, Richard. No, no, no I totally lost my question. question. <laughs> We're going to work really well today. Don't even mind it. Uh, Shots, so, please. Shots. <laughs> Line them up. <laughs> we, uh, we did propose a drinking game earlier, but it was, uh, people felt like that was an insurance risk, strangely enough. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the quilt paintings mm -hmm. then. Um, so, because I... I was 2013. <laughs> um, the um, so because that's an interesting story. I, I had no idea that uh, that quilts had their own kind of coded language and uh, a folding structure and a pattern-based structure. That uh, I'm from Canada. I'm very naive about some of these things. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that and the history of the, the quilts and patterns you choose to use. Okay. Um, so historians have been battling over this for years. There's a camp that says that these quilts, as well as lawn jockeys and a few other symbols, were used as signposts. Then there's another camp that says 
it didn't happen. It's not true. It's a myth. I'm more interested in the fact that the story persists. So that's enough for me to work so, with. Signpost, how, how so? In terms of coded language or? Oh, well, for me personally, why? I'm no, no, not you personally, in terms of these things being used. Well, because they say they can't substantiate that this is actually how they were used. Right, but how, how were they used as signposts? What, was, oh, okay. what, was, what were they, what were they uh, in, indicating? Okay, so let's say um, a group of slaves are you know, under the shade of night trying to escape, and they come to a safe, um, a safe house. There would be signs outside of that house to let them know that either they were under surveillance so they have to keep moving, or the place was open so they can safely stay there, or it's even rumored that some specific patterns on quilts were actually like maps. Like if you go another five miles and make a turn at the river or turn at the certain tree. So it was supposedly all of this language was embedded in the quilt. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, particularly with things like field song was, were notorious for having a, an elaborate coded language to them. Not only that, a lot of the dances, a lot of masters would let the slaves dance, albeit in shackle, shackles and chains, they would let them dance because they were afraid if they were to let them play drums and music that they would communicate that way. But slaves, of course, just started to make different beats and dance patterns with their feet, and that also became communication. It's all of this sort of codex. I mean, the last solo show I had in uh, Virginia was called Codex, and it's really thinking about all this coded language. But Canada comes into play because a lot of the slaves were on their way to Canada. And it is rumored that this star was supposed to be, first of all, the North Star, but the North Star was all to try to follow to get to Canada. So you are more relevant to this than you imagine. Um, <laughs> Symbolically, I put these waves on the bottom, which a lot of you probably recognize as coming from Tibetan or Buddhist imagery. But there's a story about a slave ship called the Zong. And it was in, I think, 1781 or so. It was um, a slave ship that was, uh, it, it took on water because of poor planning. They lost their water rationing. People were starting to die. So they threw 150 slaves off and then claimed the insurance on the slaves. So this is a, sort of a historic um, issue that comes, al uh, comes al up a lot in slave literature. So I started to put the waves in there to represent that notion of the Zong. Well, that's very much a, a still a hot topic in terms of the reparations dialogue because insurance company records were are pretty much the majority of the record keeping that's available of the sort of economics of the slave trade. Because you know, insurance companies being insurance companies kept everything. So mm -hmm. in terms of uh, when people try to set uh, you try to sort of come up with the determinative values for the harm and get a sense of the scope of, of how many lives were lost and things that and the insurance companies tend to be sort of one of the core things that they look to. So, so let's talk about Buddhism. Mm -hmm. I feel like Buddhism and that spiritual transcendence uh, comes up in your work over and over again. Mm -hmm. where, where does that start? Um, when I lived in Japan, I was there for around three years in the mid-90s, and I became pretty much obsessed with mandalas and I lived across the street from a temple and I would go there daily and you know bathe myself in incense and the whole thing so I think what it was for me was this notion of the middle way not to be confused with the middle passage which this is about but the middle way was an idea of living life without living at the extremes so that you are not the type of person to be taken off your path by what might come your way and being an African-American growing up in America you know that's how I have survived. Many of us have survived by finding a middle way because shit gets thrown at you all the time. How are you going to get through it? So the middle way seemed to make sense to me. And I thought, found all these different aspects of Buddhist philosophy that made sense for me. Um, that was the first thing. Then there was, once again, the visual. Um, the symbols, the mandalas, specifically the lotus. I call this piece right here lotus. And the lotus is a symbol for purity, cleanness, wholeness. And as you know, uh, lotuses come from the muck and the mire and rise to the top of a body of water and become these beautiful blossoms. So this lotus right now, although I don't have a way to zoom in, this looks like a mandala or a lotus, but each petal is actually the cross section of a slave ship. So those are diagrams from old slaver manuals of how to best pack cargo, human cargo. So transcendence once again. The lotus is a transcendent symbol. This lotus is a transcendent symbol. It's um, seven and a half foot diameter, hand etched glass. And as people walk around it, you can see them through the glass, which sort of implies all of us in this international industry of slavery, which in fact we are. Um, and it's not just an American phenomenon, obviously. Slavery has always existed, will always exist. What's a middle passage? 
A middle passage. Uh, the middle passage specifically talks about the uh, journey from Africa to various parts of South America and the Eastern Seaboard. Middle passage, I think the numbers are close to around 20 million Africans died during middle passage, either thrown off the ship or died because of conditions on the ship. And in fact, once they got to the States, that often raised the price of certain slaves because the fact that they even survived the Middle Passage meant that they were of strong stock. I'm, ho I'm horrified. So I'm, I'm, Follow that one up. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a lighthearted move here? Uh, change, how about changing gears? Let's talk about... I thought about, we were going to talk about hard drugs and porn. I, you know, I know. We should have stuck with our original plan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a good plan. So let's talk about porn now. Just kidding. Um, that might be the least appropriate follow-up question. <laughs> so now you have, uh, I think, I don't know if you are uh, unique in this, but I, certainly unique in my experience in looking around. I mean, you are in three different spaces in this show. Uh, are they three separate projects, or is it all sort of the same project in sort of three different iterations of it? And I, I just uh, came from your, um, uh, your work at Monique Malosh Gallery. Mm -hmm. So where you just had a show... Recently, or you have one coming up? Um, in the spring, I okay. did one of the wall projects there. Yeah, yeah, which I is now up at the MCA. If we're if we're hitting all the drums, <laughs> um, I consider it all basically from the same sort of project with the quilts. Um, the pieces at Monique's are actually collage pieces, actual fabric cut and then adhered onto pieces of paper and then painted on. Uh, the piece at Massimo De Carlo is and at David Castillo are all quilts antique quilts at that. All the quilts I use are antique. Um, and those are painted on, sewed on, spray painted, and so on. All of them altered. So now how do you come by the quilts? I mean, are, do you have... I mean, do you just buy them, like, at auction? Or do you research them? I mean, what's the sort of academic tack on, on okay. the, uh, finding and analyzing the quilts? The first couple of quilts I purchased online, oddly enough. Um, and from those two sources where I got my first like three quilts, I'd say. I've been in contact with them and started to learn a lot more about quilts. But coincidentally, a few weeks after one of the shows came down, this is probably around four or five years ago now, I had a quilt in my studio and I was having a studio visit. And one of the visitors before they left just pulled me to the side and she told me that she used to collect and sell quilts. She had probably 40 or 50 of them, but she was no longer doing that, and they were just collecting dust and becoming moth-ridden. So she asked me if I was interested in working with them. And I was like, you don't mind me desecrating these, do you? And she was like, I love the project. So then I had my first quilt donor. Um, since then, I've met tons of people. I mean, obviously, quilts have such a very deep um, historical presence in America. There are people that have heirlooms of quilts. Some of them like them, some of them don't. Some of them give them to me, some of them hold on to them. You know, it's, everyone has a very different relationship to them. But I found that they come out of the woodworks now. People are just like, here, I have a quilt. This was from my grandmother, and I think she would like you to do something with it because it's just sitting around over my place. Nothing's happening. So. Well, that's, I mean, it seems to me that the... I can't remember the name of the show. Uh, we were just talking about this a few minutes ago. Uh, like there was sort of a landmark uh, quilt show. G's Bend. Thank you. Gosh, what is wrong with me today? Uh, and it seems like the uh, amount of research and thinking in terms of the symbolism and the dialogue and the dialogue about whether or not this was a symbolic language, mm -hmm. and it seems to be it seems like an art form that suddenly just came to, you know, suddenly academic, you know, life's uh, attention, mm -hmm. even though it had obviously been around for a long time. Uh, so. I, in terms of your work and being able to look at research of that, I mean, how much have you had done a lot of extensive, extensive looking into the history of those? And It's a world. It's a whole universe in and of itself. Um, when I did the project in Philadelphia and I was showing some quilts, I, there was a dialogue, you know, not too diff different than this, that was held at the, the, the venue. And it was packed, but it was not packed with art world people. It was packed with quilters, <laughs> quilters all from around Philadelphia oh and Pennsylvania. Yes, and they were pissed. They were like, what are you doing in these things? Do you know about this stitch and blah, blah, blah. It was crazy. And I was like, I don't make the quilts. I work on the existing quilt. Well, and, That's and very you, important. And, and, and I don't and make sure these quilts. I just cut them up. Well, yeah, I'm sure you, from their perspective, you're defacing them. That's, that's yeah, but you know, the thing about it in that conversation, I was like, I, you know, I felt a certain way before doing it. And I should preface this. When I started painting, as a child, I first started painting by doing graffiti in Los Angeles on the walls and buses. So before I got busted and then ended up taking oil painting classes. So 
when I get these quilts, there is part of that, that sort of sense of maybe I am doing graffiti on something that already exists. Um, but I think it's more that I'm a contributor. A lot of these quilts were made by quilting groups. I consider myself to maybe be part of that quilting group years after the fact. And I find it very interesting that people consider it you know, a woman's art form. I'm not that interested in labeling it as such. I just find them to be beautiful. And I remember the G's Ben show. I thought that was the best painting show I saw in around a decade. No, the design were just pretty incredible. So, and that was when it was at the Whitney. And I say that with a little bit of irony, but it's true. It's like sort of the pinnacle of modernism right there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I hadn't even considered the fact that you would sort of rile up, uh, you know, an audience that looked at those as art objects in and of themselves. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, from you know, contemporary art perspective, it's, it's, such, it's so entrenched uh, repurposing of things and recontextualizing is so much a part of modernist uh, art practice, the mm -hmm. thought that, you know, you get a bunch of people who were cool to fishing on those, mm -hmm. you know, pitchforks and torches, you know, well, riled I, up. So. I consider myself to be rewriting history, R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, rewriting history directly on those quilts because it is a political act when you have a black male painting on these quote-unquote sacred antique Americana quilts. And most of these were made by white practitioners, not black practitioners. I've got that much of the research. It's pretty interesting. But, you know, there's documentaries about quilting right now, and it's actually a sort of a fiercely competitive field. It's a strange thing. Does it matter that they're anonymous? Hmm? Does it matter that they're anonymous? Like, what if a G's been quilting him? Ooh. Um, if I can find the author of a quilt, which is very rare that I can, but if I do, I usually try to mention that. The ones that I have so far, I have no authorship. I do have years and where they and regions, but I don't have the names of the people. Um, and if you've seen the G's Bin show or the G's Bin books, they try to basically track down different families and neighborhoods and seeing what type of patterns and things that existed in certain specific areas of. Um, of the South. But if you knew who made it, if you had a trajectory of that, would that change the work and how you approached it? Would it make it more collaborative? Would it would that change your approach? It may. You know, it's something that I would consider. I mean, I have considered collaborating with people who I know are quilting right now, but it's, you know, once again, it's a very proprietary thing. You know, actually, they're more proprietary than I am about it, so it's a very interesting dialogue. Well, I mean, probably in the same way that if, if one of the, you know, if, if they, if you did a series of paintings and they wanted to cut them up, put them in quilts, mm -hmm. you know, it would be sort of recontextualizing their art in a way that they didn't necessarily have control over. So there's certainly a complicated dynamic there. Please. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's the smile. The, the question is, how does the smile relate to the clouds and the quilts and so on? This is all sort of rewriting, renaming, reclaiming, and redefining symbols, largely American symbols. Um, and I like to play this sort of dichotomous game with these things. This piece I call a Shesher, and it's a light box that blinks and disappears and reappears like the Shesher cat from Alice in Wonderland. The first time I showed this, and this is where this picture is, this is from the Black Forest in Germany, where it was up for around two months with the name Cheshire, and everyone took it for granted, very simply, that this was something about Alice in Wonderland. But when I show the exact same piece in the South, in America, it becomes the face of blackface minstrelsy. And I'm interested on how our historical experience sort of weighs down our options for defining and identifying this piece. Um, also with the lotus, it's the same thing, that, that glass piece is very seductive. The closer you get, you realize that it's actually sort of a fucked up story behind it. Um, so I like playing with that, that um, and the cloud too, just like you mentioned, the cotton clouds. So playing with the light box, I have also made clouds that are light box clouds. And the cloud has several other reasons. I mentioned the whole um, history of cotton and so on. But also doing graffiti, one of the famous graffiti effects for anyone who's starting to do graffiti are bubble effects and cloud effects, all derived from comics, pretty much. So turning it into a light box is really sort of an homage to that sort of comic book, very pop rendering of a cloud. And the cotton, yeah, so, yeah. So that, this brings up an interesting issue that we, we've talked about a little bit in the past uh, in terms of, I mean, the United States, 
uh, well, certainly has a terrible history of both racism and slavery, has not cornered the market on that. Uh, and, you know, uh, Duncan is, you know, grew up in Canada. I grew up here in the United States. And when we first started the show, uh, that we had interesting conversations about subtleties of language mm -hmm. in terms of how things are interpreted and, and, you know, Canada not having the sort of dynamic problems that we have here in the United States, although certainly I'm sure having their own special iteration. Uh, you know, it's a very, um, at least here, country specific dialogue. So how does your work, how are those aspects of your work dealing with, with race and slavery, how are those interpreted? I mean, I mean, you just described one example, but I mean, do you find that the symbolism and things are missed uh, without sort of, do you have to kind of go the extra mile in terms of education when you show in, well, you know, Austria or something? I think this actually goes to transcendence. It's one thing for me to use the symbols and talk about things that we can easily identify with and have a dialogue about here because we are, you know, a largely, many of us are Americans, or at least in America where these histories exist. But when the same work is in another environment and that history doesn't exist, it really becomes about the art itself and if that has enough to draw the viewer in. I like to make things that I consider to be not totally reliant on the backstory. They can actually exist as objects themselves. I'm a formalist, have always been, probably will always be. So that's something that I definitely take into consideration. Um, we were talking about this piece right here. I was just as the piece. Oh, yes, yes, I was just as happy seeing people walk around and just standing under this thing and wondering what the hell it was, as them knowing this whole story. Now, if I'm there to talk about it, they get more info. If they read the story, um, uh, what's the word? The catalog from the show, they get more of the information. And it's about research. A lot of it is about research. But if you go to, can you go to the Medalla glass uh, piece that you showed? So, I mean, if, if I was to look at that from a formalist perspective, I, I think it's a very attractive object and, and interesting, and, and I like the way that it works in space. But if I wasn't aware of, if I wasn't made aware of what those images are, I mean, that's, mm. that's a pretty significant, I mean, that's really kind of a big difference in mm. terms of meaning. So, I mean, how... Uh, I mean, have you, how, how, what are your thoughts on that when someone's missing that much yeah. sort of where you're going with it? Well, it's difficult. Um, you know, we have to take into consideration we're looking at this on this screen. Right. If you no, see obviously. it in person, it has an erratic nature that is very significant. Significant enough that you may not need the backstory this to This may not be impact. the best example, but I'm sure okay. there are you of work that, you know. This brings up a really interesting perspective from a collector's point, right? Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, it's, I've had situations where I've had the work and I've had the didactic wall text, and I found that that gave up too much of the story, and it didn't allow for the work to breathe and have its own mystery. Um, so it's sort of a catch-22. You know, I can explain the hell out of these pieces, but I don't know if that necessarily makes the work itself better. You know, so that's well, something I mean, I'm still trying to figure out. And ultimately, you know, uh, I don't know that it's the artist's job to be in charge of the, of making sure that the education and taxonomy of everything that they do is sort of explained to the nth degree. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I think that that's got to be a particular challenge in your work when when you're dealing with issues that are, so as, as you say, re, I mean, I don't even know that regionalism covers it, but uh, for lack of a better word, regional specific. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so I mean, if you if it was showing in Australia, it's going to have a very different dynamic. But mm -hmm. I don't you know I don't know how much of that the artist should be expected to do, because then mm -hmm. you're just explaining everything to everybody all the time. I mean, On the other hand, you, you're not sympathetic to, to, uh, to those people who have a, uh, a you know, uh, what am I trying to say, a uh, Japanese sign on their back that they don't know the language it speaks of? Like, no, because, really, because, because they're, from a collector's like, perspective. Because if they're doing that, then it's their own damn fault. But, but that's the question, right? The, the question is when you get so many different coded languages in and you bring it into a marketplace, uh, how, how does one feel confident in, in their knowledge of that work? Well, but maybe from a collector's perspective, a collector's perspective is not the perspective with which to discuss that because collectors generally are informed about what they're buying. And if they're not, that's their problem. But the question was, like, how, how, does, one, how does one navigate that problem? With their their audience and their collector base. I think the audience, you know, the audience, you know, 
I'm not to mention collectors, but in the art audience. Um, I think it's reasonable to expect that they should do a little homework. Um, I think so, yeah. You know that when one goes up to this mandala and sees the middle passage and they're not aware of what the middle passage is, that you might... I'm from Canada. I, that's all I can say. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm from New York City, and I don't even know what the middle passage is. So anyway, yeah. um, no, but I mean, the, but once again, you know, this goes back to let's say, looking at an artist's work over time. If anyone who is even remotely familiar with my work, they know there's story and lots of layers per piece, and they can basically look at this and say, I know this is a gateway to something else. And if they do a little due diligence, you know, I mean, anyone's got a smartphone, all you have to do is put my name in, you'll get the taxonomy. Yeah. Um, now, whether they do that or not, once again, like you said, I got to a point where I don't know if that's totally my responsibility to do that much of the diet. Because where does it end? Yeah. I mean, because where does it is... end? Like, is it your job to explain the entire, you know, history of slavery? I mean, is it a, is it a race dynamic in the United States? Like, I mean, it's gotta, there's got to be a, a point that, you know, at which you're absolved of responsibility yeah. to educate your audience. So. But the idea, too, is also to transcend some of these things in the first place. So if I get stuck on them, then I can't let the work transcend it. So, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's a generational thing, too. You know, the youth of today have no idea with what, what a lot of these things mean. So. Where are we time? So we're not paying attention. Give maybe one or two more questions. Do you want to? Please. <laughs> Well, I mean, time will tell, but I mean, one of the languages that we're not speaking about is the language of contemporary and modernist art, which is also embedded in this too. So that is another language I'm drawing from. And Well, you know, I think some of this is still unfolding. There's, you know, I have other symbols in this language that I've yet to put out. I mean, a new thing that I'm very interested in right now is the hood, like a hoodie. What does that mean now after everything that's happened in Florida? You know, some of this language is still being made. Um, and I also think about, once again, the youth who have no idea what that Cheshire or blackface minstrel C really is. They know the Cheshire because Hollywood but they don't necessarily know what that minstrel read is. And I think this can be a gateway for people to get some of that information. The idea is later, of course, to try to totally redefine it or obliterate it. That's why sometimes, I don't have a good example of it right now, but I have quilts that do have the Cheshire in the quilt erased, scumbled away, peeled away, ripped away. So it's starting to literally, it's an act of erasure. So I'm still you know, evolving with that language and seeing how it communicates best. Were you intentionally referencing uh, minstrel and blackface iconography with this? Um, I was, like I said, I think it's sort of a loaded gun. And it teeters on either being totally banal or totally offensive. And I really think that context is another medium. Context defines a piece. So I'm interested in the dialogue that it creates. When I show this uh, amongst older generations of black people, a lot of them are very, very hurt and you know, because of the abuse they've had from this. And once again, if I'm showing it to a 12-year-old, they're like, ah, OK, it's a smiley face. Well, because a you know, 12-year-old hasn't seen lawn jockeys and Aunt Jemima and all that, you know, the iconography that was not 
in that distant uh, history, like but part of popular exists. culture. I mean, if you look at pop culture, oh, I sure, still think no, all that stuff still has all sorts there's of, new forms yeah, of it. But it's still, you know, minstrelsy is not limited to black folks that's, anymore. You know, it's all day. Just turn but it's on. also as oh. isn't gone for the African American community either. I mean, it's still out there. Mm. So I think we've reached that point for a final question. There it is. It is definitely about transcending history. Um, a good friend of mine, singer-songwriter, um, has this lyric that I always reflect on um, about history acting as gravity. And I'm interested in transcending exactly that history, sort of rewriting it like I mentioned before. So that is the agenda behind the work. But, you know, I am trapped by my formless tendencies. I also like it to grab you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it greatly. <laughs>